Oh, good morning, everybody. It's Bernard Nomberg with another episode of Nomberg Law Live. As we do each Tuesday, we try to bring interesting conversations with their people with their areas of expertise. And I certainly have a good one today. I've got my friend Rip Andrews, attorney here in town, who's with me and going to spend a little time chatting. How are you doing today, Rip? Great, Bernard. Thanks for having me on. Um, as I mentioned to you just a minute ago, uh, I've I've poked around and watched these and. Um, Happy to be invited and uh, have any chance to talk to you, whether on Facebook Live or anywhere else. Well, that's very kind of you, but I'm glad that you're here with me today. We've got some good topics to talk about. But before we jump into those, uh, for those of you who don't know Rip or his what he does professionally, he's an attorney with Marsh Reichert and Brian Law Firm. They handle complex cases and have done so quite admirably and are really a well-known firm in our state, regionally and nationally. Uh, Rip is the past president, I want to emphasize past president, on the uh, ALAJ. That used to be known as the Alabama Trial Lawyers, but it's the Alabama Association for Justice. And I'm a proud David and I are proud members for many, many years. And the organization, uh, I guess the simplest way to, rep to, to, to share with you is that they help to represent those who are harmed, those who are in need the most. But I want to turn it over to you, Rip, to share a little bit more about your practice and what you did as, I guess, as the outgoing president, why it was important for you to be involved with ALAJ. Yeah, sure. Thanks. So on my practice, um, you know, I I have focused traditionally on sort of products cases. Um, I, I found a little bit of a niche doing MedMal um, just because those cases tend to try and I've, I've been lucky enough to win some trials, but I really, what I've, I, I think probably at my firm, what, what is, you know, to the extent we have areas of focus, um, I, I tend to focus on cases uh, as much as I can and as much as I can find them that are a little bit outside the box and, you know, sort of um, have a good story. Like my, one of my big tests for cases is like if I were, with friends and started talking about one of my cases, would it be interesting to the folks, you know, I was talking to that aren't, don't follow law and all that kind of thing. And so, you know, uh, proud to represent the the family of uh, Mr. Parker, who was uh, now officially murdered, um, as the verdict said, up in Huntsville um, by Officer Darby, um, you know, had, did a really neat case that had some larger repercussions in the um, sort of birthing world. Um, and so anyway, that's, that's what I try to do when I can, obviously, um, you know, I, in a large part, take what comes to me, but, um, and then as president of the Allergy, um, really enjoyed doing that. I didn't expect to enjoy doing it as much as I, I did. I, I made a conscious decision, um, a couple of decades ago to get out of politics, but, um, it was my time to serve. And, um, you know, it's obviously a strange year, uh, being down in the legislature, wearing masks 90% of the time. But uh, I will say it was really good for me on a personal level because I think, and this is probably true of a lot of us, but I had really gotten um, in a bubble um, of folks I was interacting with. And I guess, I mean, we were sort of told to be in a bubble. So maybe I shouldn't fault myself too much for that. But I, it, that experience interacting with a lot of people who are more conservative than I am and just at times have a different worldview than I do really woke me up to the fact that something that used to be a big priority of mine, which is having a diverse group of friends with diverse viewpoints um, was a priority of mine. And that gave me an opportunity to do that and, and, you know, help me understand the ways I feel about things better than I would have without some really meaningful conversations I got to have down there. You know, it, it really has, I always try to look for the silver linings and bad things. And with during this pandemic, there's many, many silver linings, including something like the way that you have experienced and described. And one of the, the main topics for us to dive into, Rip, is, is something I've always thought that was one of the things that gives me meaning being a lawyer. And, and that's the responsibility of being a community leader. And I've, 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 we learned that, David and I learned that from our father, just watching him uh, for many, many years down in Dothan as we were growing up and his law firm. And just as a, then becoming a, a young lawyer up here in Birmingham, starting my career, watching the older lawyers in my firm 
and then just getting involved. I think it's just vitally important. And I know your firm and you and many members of the firm are very, uh, I guess the, be the best way, you're, you're, you're very much involved in your communities on many ways. And I know one of which uh, you've been involved with is with Oasis Counseling for Women and, and Children. It, it, tell us a little bit about that organization and why it's important to you, your family or the firm. Sure. Yeah. You know, I, leadership uh, as a lawyer, and before I sort of dive into the specific question, let me comment on your, your sort of intro on that. And this has been a very sort of recent realization of mine um, based on some involvement I've had recently that I think we'll probably talk about a little later. But, you know, there are a lot of um, really intelligent, really creative, really kind, really beautiful, wonderful people that have a lot to offer in terms of community involvement, but quite frankly, right, may have very social anxiety or may not on a day-to-day -day basis be involved in public speaking or may not, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, if you're any kind of litigator, be, you know, be, they're not used to people being mean to them, right? And it can be just debilitating, devastating if they try to sort of step foot in the public square in a leadership role where there may be some level of controversy or, or disagreement. Um, and so I think lawyers, right, who are less, maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing, but are less susceptible to that. Um, you know, we have thicker skin, don't get our feelings hurt as easily, um, you know, really have, have a role to step into those arenas, no matter what their perspective, um, because they can, I think, elevate the debate and, um, you know, understand opposing viewpoints and also if somebody calls them a name or says something bad about them you know they just sort of wake up the next morning because you get used to that but so I, I do think they have an important role so my first interaction with oasis actually was um courtney and i i guess what 13 years ago now did our pre-marriage counseling there um and had a really successful um experience that we sort of sat there for three days and just sort of told the counselor about ourselves and kept going home being like, why are we paying for those things? We're just talking. And the end, she like was like said two things, one about me, one about Courtney that were just like, bam, bam. And are still like awarenesses we have about our marriage that help us work. So I've been a big supporter of the group. Um, and, you know, recently my involvement of uh, has been uh, because they, we're helpful in this process uh, that that me and a buddy put together during the pandemic, um, and um, we're nice enough to sort of honor us afterwards um, with some recognition. But but what it was was where um, we we read this article. This is my friend Will Baker. He's my best friend from childhood. He's not a lawyer, but his dad, Alan Baker, who passed away actually in the last year, um, was a well-known lawyer at Balch and big influence on my life. Anyway, he read an article in San Francisco during the height of the pandemic about this program that we thought would work well in Birmingham and, and did where um, we would, we created, a, actually his wife did it, Susanna, she's amazing and a nurse. We created a sign up genius where um, a, a group of nurses or doctors or whatever at one of the local hospitals could sign up and say, we want 20 lunches on Thursday. And then a local restaurant who was suffering, right, um, would sign up and say, okay, we can provide these lunches on Thursday at this cost per lunch. And then a local, you know, individual, but m more often law firms and corporations would sign up and say, okay, we will pay the cost. So it provided sort of healthier, better lunches for these, you know, nurses and other healthcare professionals working overtime during the pandemic, during sort of the real part um, early on in spring and summer, uh, provided ne necessary cash flow for the restaurants. This was before PPP money <laughs> kicked in um, and gave, you know, firms like mine and others and other, you know, good community business leaders, the opportunity to sort of do something nice for folks. So um, Oasis worked with us on that and was nice enough to give us a little honor af after all that. So that's my experience with them. I I'm so glad that you brought up that, f I'll call it the food delivery program. Mm -hmm. uh, David and I and our firm were very happy to contribute our little part with that. I thought y'all did. I couldn't 100% remember, so I didn't want to say it, but I thought y'all did. We, we did, and, and it kind of came a little bit full circle. I didn't realize at the time, but one of the group's deals that we had uh, delivered to a specific nurses unit at UAB, one of my current clients happened to be working on that shift in that unit. 
and she let us know after the fact. So it was just a very a nice surprise uh, for us. We were able to help just a little bit in our way, uh, but that's, I certainly applaud the efforts that you guys did to, to organize that. And that's just one small, it's not small, it's one example of, of lawyers stepping up in the community and, and doing things that not necessarily were ever asked. They just see a need and they fulfill what that, that void, if you will. And, and I know your firm is very proud of your efforts with that as, as well as yourself and your family. Rip, I, I kind of want to uh, pivot a little bit. Uh, staying, staying in this same uh, topic, in this same mindset, I want to talk a little bit about an organization that I saw so, a few months ago uh, that I've seen online that I know you're involved with, and it's called MB or Mountain Brook Listens. What is that organization, and can you share a little bit about what it's doing? Sure. So it's a brand new organization, and I still think we're we're trying to exactly find our path and our lane. Um, but uh, it was started by a couple of Mountain Brook residents, uh, and then there became sort of a core group, which I was honored to be asked to be a part of. Courtney, my wife, as well. Um, and basically, the idea, I guess, before I explain Mountain Brook listens from my perspective, I, it's probably important to talk a little bit about my connection to that community. Um, I was born and raised in Mount Brook, as I joke, I went, I went there all 14 years because I had to repeat kindergarten. Um, I was, uh, it, my, my upbringing in large part was sort of single parent, um, single income for a lot of the time. My mom was longtime director of Hulu Library and we, we struggled to make the, you know, in hindsight, I know about mortgages and car payments and all that stuff. I didn't fully understand at the time, but I knew that we struggled to make those payments, but my mom was super committed to me getting that education. Um, I, incre I really valued my time here. Um, and uh, when we were making a decision as a family sort of where to live, um, Courtney was born and raised here too. Uh, we, we really struggled because there are just so many wonderful things about Mount Brook. Obviously it's beautiful, has incredible schools, incredible people. Um, and it does provide a unique, um, unique experiences in terms of diversity of faiths, which a lot of communities don't. Um, as you know, obviously there's a robust and you know wonderful Jewish population in the school system and in the community, but it does not provide that experience uh, you know, in terms of families of color. But objectively, if you look at the data, right, um, even compared to other over the mountain communities, um, there, there is, I, I would argue you can look at the data and it should should awaken in you the idea that perhaps Mountain Brook is has not found a way to be sufficiently welcoming to families of color, and I think that um, that was a negative for us in in choosing to live in Mountain Brook. But for us, ultimately, rightly or wrongly, the positives outweighed the negatives, and we decided to raise our children here and send them to the same elementary school that I went to, which is sort of a beautiful sight. But I know that. You know, 20 years from now, when my kids um, are, are deciding where to raise their kids, if that's how their lives turn out, they may not, you know, they may not make the same decision if, if Mountain Brook doesn't look a little different than it does today. So um, Mountain Brook Listens is a group of people that sort of feel that way and want to, you know, provide a space and an opportunity for people that um, are interested in making Mountain Brook a more welcoming place for people of all backgrounds, um, families of color, families of all face. Um, and uh, we're sort of, you know, at, at the beginning phases of trying to figure out how to best do that. Um, just recently, and I know we're going to talk about this, um, you know, there's been some turmoil regarding um, some teacher training that the school board did. And so we've sort of, you know, our membership, at least, I don't know if in an organization we have any official positions on on that issue, but our membership has has really worked hard to try to communicate with the school board and the administration our support for the basic idea that um, there's a there's a school board goal number four strategic goal number four to honor diversity in our community been around since 2017 to express our support for that goal and to you know meet and talk over beers and coffee and everything else with folks that maybe hold a slightly different perspective on that and have some concerns about exactly how those committees will operate and who is on them, try to find some common ground with them so that we can, you know, move forward on these issues in a way that doesn't freak people out because it, it shouldn't freak people out. 
No, it, it really, it should not. And for those of you who are watching us live or will join us later on the, the rebroadcast of this, I'm talking with Birmingham attorney Rip Andrews. Rip is one of the community leaders on many different fronts. He and his firm do such a wonderful job with that. And specifically, we're talking about responsibilities of lawyers being community leaders. And more, most specifically, we're talking now about what's currently going on in Mountain Brook. Last school term, there were some anti-Semitic actions that took place, including uh, one of the students had swastikas actually drawn on his body. And that prompted a movement within the Mountain Brook community, as well as much larger communities, that something needed to be addressed about this. And what was in the news actually today, I believe it was today, was that Mountain Brook backtracks on anti-bias training after parent criticism links to critical race theory. Now, obviously, Rip, you and I could spend the next two days talking about this and we won't have specific answers or a solution. But the fact that we're talking about it, I think is a very positive thing in the right direction. So I guess my question, going back to the MB Listens, and, and I think you partly addressed this, is there something that MB Listens is dealing with now on having on this very topic that's in the news? Is there something that can be done through that organization uh, to help continue these conversations and help bring about positive change? Yeah, so I, I personally think so. Um, you know, I, I, I think you're referencing the AL.com article published um, this morning. I, and I don't, I don't mean to ever be, it's like, for some reason, I, f I feel hesitant to be critical of the media ever, because like, I feel like that's something that's like easy for people of all perspectives to do these days. And I just, there's, you know, nothing more important than a free press. But, but I, I think that article didn't, um, I think it made Mountain Brook maybe look a little bit bad. And I, I wonder sometimes if, you know, in, if you think about AL.com, perhaps an article that made Mountain Brook look bad or racist might get more clicks than one that made it look sure. a little more unified and, sure. um, and sort of fair minded and, and, and thoughtful. Um, so, you know, and I, I'm not, but listen, I mean, nobody hired me to write articles on AL.com. So, I mean, that's, that's what those, those not yet are. anyway, not yet. <laughs> You're right. Right. So, but, um, you know, I, what I experienced last night, there was a city council meeting, um, to address some of these issues, some sort of related issues with library books and, um, using Mount Brook public spaces for various, uh, groups, Mount Brook listens sponsored and, art festival there the other day. And um, I think that bothered some people. And so the city council did a great job of explaining, you know, our public spaces are open to, um, you know, any group that is, you know, willing to fill out the paperwork and pay the registration fee. And we, we can't as a government be involved in deciding which groups, you know, should be able to use public spaces and which groups shouldn't. They also did a good jo job of explaining that, you know, the library is a place where we present all the books that people would want to check out and that if you if you want a certain book then you pick it up and you take it home if you don't like that book or don't want your kids to read that book then you don't pick it up and take it home and um i was proud of the council uh the entire council for explaining those issues and also explaining that you know they don't control the schools and that you know decades and decades ago it was set up that way on purpose to have not an elected school board not an elected superintendent so that they don't feel the whims of random political outrages of the day and that they can focus uh, long term strategically on improving our schools and 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 keeping our schools some of the most competitive in the nation. So um, I, I think that there I think the vast, vast majority, um, I mean, truly, I believe 85, 95 percent of Mountain Brook parents with school age children um, want their schools to be a welcoming place for people of all colors and face and everything else. I also believe that same percentage supports the idea that Mountain Brook could do a better job of equipping our students to operate in a diverse world and have more experiences with people of diverse backgrounds as they grow up. I think the vast majority of Mountain Brook residents believe in that. I think the concern has come in exactly how you implement that. And, you know, I'm somebody, right, who probably 
would rather see a little more substantial change a little faster. Um, but I also have some really good friends who are really smart, really kind people who I joke, I call them diversity hesitant, but that's not the reality. They're just, they, they want to be sure that there is not a mix of um, when, when you're training teachers or educating students on, you know, respecting people of all backgrounds and welcoming people of all backgrounds, they don't want that to bleed over into teaching what they consider to be overtly political issues. And I get that. I mean, I don't, I don't want my kids in school being told to vote for this person or that person for city council or president. Um, so I'm, I'm with them on that. Obviously the difficulty comes in that that's somewhere of a, that's somewhat of a blurry line. I had a um, parent that I engaged last night at the council meeting. I sat outside with two lawn chairs and a, and a cooler of beer said, you know, we need to be a little more united on this. If anybody wants to talk about these issues, sit down and have a beer and let's talk. And nobody took me up on the beer, but I did have a lot of cool conversations. And um, one of them um, sort of involved uh, just this idea of like, you know, what, what can we do? And apparently some number of years ago, Mountain Brook High School Theater Department joined up with, I think it was Woodlawn's Theater Department to do a joint production of To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, great experience for both high schools, obviously, um, kids meeting each other that wouldn't have probably otherwise met each other. And, you know, this person was a little more, they, I think they would have said they were on an opposite side of me. I don't really see it through that frame, but I think that's how they would have explained it. But they thought that was a great idea and they'd love for their kids to have that opportunity to do that. Um, and we talked about how like, you know, in history class, you got to teach the civil rights movement, right? You can't just not teach that. And you, you can't teach the civil rights movement without discussing politics. So like, there's some blurry lines there, but I think if we stop shouting at each other um, through city councilors and school board members and just sit down and talk to each other, we can probably find a, a, a path forward to, you know, to do a good job in the schools of addressing these issues without offending anyone's sort of political sensibilities on either side of the political aisle. So anyway, long answer. No, it's a great answer. And I appreciate you sharing your experiences about this rip. The sad reality is Mountain Brook was created about 100 years ago and these issues were then, these issues are now, but these issues are being discussed. They're hopefully being openly discussed. When you have newspaper articles that come out, when we have conversations like we're having right now, it can only, in my opinion, my humble opinion, push the conversation forward, hopefully in a positive manner. And Unfortunately, it's the focus today is on Mountain Brook, but it's not to say that Mountain Brook's the only over the mountain community that deals with these issues. It just happens to be Mountain Brook is the one in the spotlight right now because of what happened last school term. But these things happen all over the state, all over the country. But with that said, let's get back to what our original focus was for today was the responsibility of lawyers in our community. And you pulling up with some chairs and beer and say, hey, let's have a, a, a talk about these things. That's you as, as a citizen of, of the city, of, of, of city of Mountain Brook. That's you as a, a lawyer. That's just you being a leader. That's who you are. And not all lawyers can feel or feel that their personality will allow them to do something like that. And I think this, there's, it, it's, it's, Tell me if you if you see this a little differently, Rip. Not everybody can try a case in front of a jury and present themselves. That's that's their strength. I know you enjoy doing that. That's the way your personality is. That's how you lead. But other lawyers have other types of personalities that don't let themselves in front of a jury, but they are phenomenal leaders in their own way. And I guess what I'm saying with this is from your perspective, Rip, what do you see other lawyers doing? And you don't have to name names unless you feel compelled. What do you see them doing in our community toward issues like we're dealing with in Mountain Brook or any other issues uh, that are going on, such as the pandemic? Many other examples. Sure. I mean, I, I and, and I don't, I mean, a lot of people have lots of different skills um, and, and that's true among lawyers as well. I, but 
before I answer the broader question, let me say one of the points I wanted to make from earlier was I, I had the opportunity to meet with a few school board members and our superintendent who I've known for a long time because um, he was the assistant principal my senior. He, his first year in the Mount Brook school systems as assistant principal in the high school was my senior year. Um, and they had been dealing with a lot of, you know, I think pretty aggressive in some cases, maybe sort of hateful over the line emails and phone calls about some of these issues. And it, it, in meeting with them, I could tell like what an emotional toll it had taken on them. And, you know, it sort of dawned on me in that moment that, you know, most, most people don't go to work with folks that, you know, are literally being paid hundreds of dollars an hour to, you know, try to mess up what they're doing. And, you know, because of that at times, and I, I'm, I'm not excluding myself from this, you know, not, not be the most polite or professional that they could be. Um, and, you know, a lot of us do, and that gives us a certain perspective and thick skin. And, um, you know, I, I think that, that perspective, and I, I am speaking more about litigators here, but that perspective, that thick skin, that ability to realize that like, just because somebody's mad at you right now, doesn't mean they're going to be mad at you even five minutes from now. You know, sometimes you just got to sort of sit through that. And certainly they probably won't be mad at you five days from now, you know, and, and, and we have that perspective. We have that sort of ability. Um, and, and so I think that that does maybe create a little bit of extra responsibility for us to get out there and some of these controversial issues and be willing to be leaders in terms of lawyers that maybe are not as, as litigation focused uh, and doing more work behind the scenes, I will say um, I've reached out to as many people as I can um, over the past uh, few weeks as this issue has sort of boiled over. And um, probably, I mean, I hate to, but probably the two best conversations um, that I've had with folks who, again, I don't like the two sides frames frame, but folks that maybe have a different perspective on these issues than I do were with lawyers. Um, and they, I think it was because, I mean, they were, edu they educated themselves on the issues so we could have a conversation without necessarily having to sort of me tell this person everything I know and then tell me everything they knew. They were educated already on the issue as I'm trying to be. They were open-minded, right? The, the idea was let me actually listen to Rip so that I can, you know, put into my own thoughts what what his position is I know he's going to actually listen to me um, and and reform his thoughts based on my perspective and they were just incredibly productive conversations and I don't I'm, I'm so hesitant to like brag on lawyers I guess but but I that was a great experience I had with two two community lawyers with different perspectives than I did but who were super engaged and willing to rethink and relearn things so anyway well Lawyers get a bad name way too often. It's too easy to, to hate lawyers, to pick on lawyers, except for the one who's representing you right now. That's sure. your, he's the greatest lawyer in the world, or she sure. she's awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's right. But everybody else, they're terrible. But it's things like this, and this is why I do this program. It's not necessarily always to highlight what lawyers do. I, I, I have conversations with people from all walks of society, all types of professions. But until we point out the good that lawyers do in the community to help to promote the greater good, uh, folks just kind of look past that. And that's why we're having this conversation today. That's why, Rip, I so appreciate the work that you do, that your wife does, that the, the, your firm uh, has always stepped up and been in the forefront of, of issues to help those who need it the most. And that's, I just applaud your, your efforts for that. And I know that you're not done. I know there's a lot of work uh, still to be done on this specific issue that we're talking about here, dealing with Mountain Brook, but also other things with Oasis, whatever it is that, that is of interest to you and your family. So I want to thank you for, for sharing those thoughts. I know you and I could talk for the next hour, but we both got stuff we got to get going uh, for the rest of the day. So thank you for your your time and, and sharing a little bit of your story with us today, Rip. Hey, thank you for the opportunity. Love that you do this stuff. It's super cool. Uh, I wish more people would do it. So thanks for the opportunity. Enjoyed it. My, my pleasure. And, and folks, thank you for those who watched us live, commented, questioned uh, everything. I put links to some of the things we talked about today. I put a link to the website for Oasis Counseling. 
I put a link to the article that we we addressed about Mountain Brook, and also put a link to uh, MB Listens. Thanks. And so you guys can easily access that in the show notes, as we do each Tuesday at 10 o'clock Central, 8 a.m. Pacific, Nomberg Law Live. We've been, gosh, we're well over 200 of these conversations, and we're going to keep on going. And uh, thank you again for showing up. Thank you, Rip. You guys have a great rest of your week and be safe out there. It's a wet, rainy day in Birmingham. Do well. Bye-bye. See ya.